So, vielen Dank, Roderick. Ähm, ich fand das einen sehr anregenden Mix aus sehr konkreten und pragmatischen und grundsätzlichen Überlegungen, auch mit unterschiedlichen Optionen und Szenarien. Ähm, deren Eintreffen oder Nicht-Eintreffen ja nicht zuletzt von unseren Handlungen abhängt. Ähm, wir fahren jetzt fort mit einem kleinen Gespräch zu dritt und ich begrüße ganz herzlich in unserer Mitte Rosa Balfour. Ähm, sie ist Senior Fellow im Europaprogramm des German Marshall Fund arbeitet seit vielen Jahren zu Fragen europäischer Außensicherheitspolitik, ähm, europäische Beziehungen im Mittelmeerraum, Osteuropa, Balkanstaaten und auch zur Bedeutung von Menschenrechten und Demokratie für die internationalen Beziehungen. Ähm, ist also prädestiniert für unsere heutige Debatte. Und ich würde, Rosa, Sie gerne bitten, das Gespräch zu eröffnen mit einer Kommentierung ähm, unseres Einleitungsvortrags, aber Sie sind natürlich auch frei, eigene zusätzliche Aspekte hier in die Diskussion mit einzubringen. Bitte sehr. Thank you very much and thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, I very much appreciate this kind of engagement of reflection in a more political context, which I think is very important for all of us. Um, right. Well, I think, uh, I'm not sure I can match your eloquence, but I think there are a few points that I'd like to uh, make, which run parallel very much to what um, Roderick was saying. Um, the first, in many respects, is quite a banal point, but I think we need to make it, because I know that you agree with me, but you've used the terminology refugee crisis. And I actually disagree with using the terminology refugee crisis. Um, I think what we have seen is a refugee influx, um, and we have seen a short circuit at the European level, um, which manifested itself in an inability to deal with these large numbers of people largely fleeing from conflict zones. So what we have is a political crisis, and a governance crisis. It's not a refugee crisis. Um, of course, we have a broader picture in which mobility and migration issues are likely to, be, to remain important and very difficult to handle. So they do pose major challenges about how we organize ourselves to contribute to governing mobility in a peaceful way and in a, in a in a way which respects human dignity. So there is a big challenge there, but I think we should stop calling it refugee crisis um, because it sends political messages. And in an age in which um, we seem to be living, which is an age of political irresponsibility, where politicians are not afraid of lying, I think we need to be precise. That's the most, one of the most important ways of countering um, these kind of narratives and these kind of um, platforms um, which um, can foment um, emotional and uh, negative reactions. Now, the challenge that we have, um, there, it's at least at three levels, and I think I'd like to spend some time perhaps on two of these levels, and I think the conference today and tomorrow will definitely look at the third level. Um, one is about domestic politics and the way in which it is increasingly shaping um, in rather unpredictable and unstructured ways um, collective decisions which are taken at the European level. So that's one thing that we need to take into account. Another level is the governance of the, Europe, the EU level. Um, we've seen that much of the chaos has happened, and you mentioned that also in your opening remarks, Ralph, has been really about unilateral, um, disorderly responses by member state governments governments without coordination. And I think we need, if we want to, and again, this reflects what Roderick was saying, if we need to understand the situation where we are in order to think ahead, we do need to understand why things went wrong. Um, and that's another level where, that we need to look at. The third level is about um, international law 
is about international protection of migrants, is about the various principles around which, which we have built in the whole post-Second World War period. Um, and I think here there's a bigger and broader discussion that needs to be had um, on what principles we want to continue supporting, what principles we want to fight for, and, and with whom do we engage in a discussion of those principles if we need to change them, if we need to work in that direction. So I think my second point, if I may, I'm going to be brief because I know you want to have a conversation, but I just want to get two or three messages across. Um, my second point is, is about the EU level. Um, I think we've seen a problem in foresight and in preparing the institutions for responding. I still haven't understood, and I've, I've asked, been asking this question in a sort of, a bit like Candide, yeah? I know it's, it might, it's probably a very stupid question. Why were the responsibility to protect principles not mobilized in August 2015? The responsibility to protect principles are not about bombing. Well, they are also about military intervention, but they, they state that other states have a responsibility in ensuring international protection of citizens who are fleeing a state which cannot or does not ensure those rights. The European Union could have mobilized its resources, which exist. There are plenty of emergency crisis rooms. There are civil protection mechanisms which have been tested on other problems, such as flooding in the Balkans. Why have they not been mobilized? In, why were they not mobilized in August 2015 when the movement of people became dangerous? Um, why was the principle of guaranteeing safe passage to people fleeing conflict, why was it not so, um, why was it not um, um, uh, utilized? I don't have an answer to this, but I do think that from the very beginning, this whole issue could have been framed very differently. And having not framed it differently, Europe went into chaos. But it's not because of the refugees, it's because there was a political choice at some point, or, or an, an inadverted and unintended consequence of a lack of a political choice, which went in that direction. And this is, is causing a deep political crisis in the European Union, as well as in the governance mechanisms, because there clearly wasn't a system that was, was, that was capable of putting forward alternative proposals to what ended up being unilateral disorderly um, responses. A large part of the reason for these unilateral disorderly responses lie in domestic politics. Um, and I think we know this. We know what we're talking about. We're talking about the populace. We're talking about the fact that most, gov most governments um, feel under um, electoral threat. They feel weak. They feel that they will lose the next elections. Indeed, most governments in the past few years since the, since the economic crisis, with the exception of Germany, Poland, and Britain, surprisingly, all other governments have changed. Most governments do not last more than for their cycle, their electoral cycle. So they have very, politicians have very short term um, horizons. Um, and they all have been feeling under the, 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 the threat of populist movements. Um, but these, um, the surge of these movements, the success of these movements is not because of migrants coming. It's not because of the refugee crisis. We haven't seen what we have seen in Germany or in Austria, in Greece, and Greece is at the forefront of this. We are partially seeing it in Italy, but for completely different reasons, and it's not to do with the influx of migrants. So we have to be very careful about why there is a domestic political problem here. It's not about migration. The, the root causes are different, and they need to be looked for, and I, I don't want to go into this discussion because I know that we'd be going um, beyond the um, uh, conversation that we're having today and tomorrow here in this conference. Third point, I think we need to contextualize the current political crisis, which comes as a consequence of the inability to respond to the refugee influx. And I realize that you can't put this into a, a tweet, whereas you can put refugee crisis into a tweet. But I think we still need to be precise. Um, we need to contextualize where we are. And of course, had Europe not been in a difficult situation um, with a whole other set of crises, possibly this would have been dealt with differently. The refugee influx would have been dealt with differently. And this leads me to think uh, it, was, it was John Kerry who said Europe is in an existential crisis. And it has got me thinking, what is it? What does it mean? 
what is an existential crisis. And I see an existential crisis as a systemic crisis. Well, in that case, Crimea, the invasion of Crimea, the annexation of Crimea, that is existential in the sense that it's changed the, um, the European security order. And that is an order which enabled the European Union to, to develop and to become what it is today. So in that sense, that is existential. Should Britain vote to leave the European Union, that would be an existential crisis because it changes the fundamental structures of, of Europe and it establishes the principle which does not exist in European integration and in the treaties that a country can leave, which for some reason is not, hasn't been, that principle has never been established. But is, my, is the migration, is the movement of people an existential threat? I don't think so. I also don't, I also don't think other phenomena related to geopolitical developments in, uh, towards our south, in our south, so terrorism, for instance, I don't think that is an existential threat. These are things that can make Europe, it, they require uh, European responses, they require um, um, cooperation, um, they can potentially trigger greater cooperation, but they're not existential threats. So I think we need to understand the situation in which in which Europe is today um, in order to find appropriate responses. Which finally leads me, I'm sort of probably going, but I, I, for the sake of brevity, I will um, maybe do some uh, uh, logical leaps. It leads me to wonder whether, um, what can be done? Hmm? Because I think that in, among the questions that I received, there was also a sort of forward-looking um, aspect um, to it. What can be done? Um, as Roderick mentioned, in principle, timing is the essence. Uh, June is a critical month. Um, we can only expect, because this is what's happened in the past few years, that flows of people increase um, for, through the central Mediterranean route, for instance, which has already um, seen uh, more uh, boats leaving. So there will be more pressure. Uh, the Turkish issue is becoming politically more contentious and difficult to deal with. Um, and um, the, the, the clock is ticking. Um, Europeans expect responses, but the political context to produce those responses is quite simply not there. The relocation mechanism which the Commission proposed, which in theory one would expect being the basis for any uh, di discussion on the future of common asylum policy, has hardly been implemented. And those member states which oppose it have not shifted whatsoever on that position. So we're really not in the political context to produce responses. And I do wonder whether it's worth producing responses that are not going to work, that are going to backfire because they're not going to work, and that are going to continue to undermine the institutions that are, that are presenting them. And I'm thinking in particular of the Commission, which I think is suffering enormously from a political point of view. Um, in terms of legitimacy and authoritativeness. So I'm actually wondering whether the solution lies elsewhere, and I'm going to finish here, whether perhaps we should think up something completely different, which will bring citizens to be a little bit, to have a little bit more trust in these institutions, and that therefore, by rebuilding trust on other themes, then one can start having a common discussion about the future <coughs> of uh, asylum and migration policy. Thanks a lot, Rosa. Um, ich würde gerne dieses letzte Stichwort aufgreifen als Einstieg in unsere kleine Diskussion hier. Das Schlüsselwort war Trust. Rebuilding trust in the institutions and in the ability to act, yeah, to, to, to meet the challenges uh, Europe is facing. So I switch back in, in German. Um, man, man konnte diese, diesen Widerspruch im Grunde schon finden in den Bemerkungen von, von, von Roderick. Jedenfalls fiel er mir so auf, weil ähm, ich fand einen Schlüsselsatz von Ihnen, äh, als Sie sozusagen den, den politisch-psychologischen Kontext der Flüchtlingsdebatte beschrieben haben, dass Sie sagten, es ist uns ein Stück die Gestaltungszuversicht verloren gegangen. Sie nannten es, glaube ich, die liberale Weltsicht, the liberal worldview. Ähm, Gestaltungszuversicht in, in verschiedenen Dimensionen. Einmal mit Blick auf die Stabilisierung der Nachbarregionen. Also Stichworte State Building und äh, eine erfolgreiche Entwicklungskooperation, äh, die zu 
ähm, ökonomischem Wachstum und sozialem Aufstieg in diesen Ländern sagen, führt. Und bei uns herrschte eher, als die Zahlen hochgingen im, im, im letzten Herbst sagen, der Flüchtlinge, so ein Bild, das ist nur der Vorbote einer riesigen Völkerwanderung. Der Begriff Völkerwanderung fiel ständig bei uns hier in der Diskussion. Also es geht nicht um eine Million, es geht nicht um zwei Millionen, es geht um zig Millionen, die sozusagen auf gepackten Koffern sitzen und nur darauf äh, warten, Zuflucht in Europa. Und das war, glaube ich, ein Element von Panik für einen Teil der, der sagen, Be Bevölkerung. Also diese Angstprojektion. Und die Angstprojektion hatte sagen, viel zu tun mit, mit, diesem, ja, mit diesem verloren gegangenen Zutrauen, dass wir in der Lage sind, ähm, durch kooperative Politik diese Nachbarregion zu, zu stabilisieren. Ich glaube, dass das ein zentraler Punkt ist, auf den man eine Antwort äh, sagen, finden muss. Äh, und eine zweite sagen, Panik, äh, sagen, Projektion hängt auch mit einem Verlust an, an Zuversicht äh, zusammen. Es ist ja was völlig anderes, wenn Sie über die Integration von Flüchtlingen und Migranten sprechen in einer Situation von wirtschaftlichem Aufschwung, und ökonomischem Optimismus oder in einer Situation von ökonomischer Stagnation und äh, sagen wirtschaftlichem Pessimismus. Und diese, das kennzeichnet aber eigentlich die Stimmungslage in den meisten europäischen Ländern. Und ich glaube, das ist ein zweiter Schlüssel. Also wenn man im Sinne von Rosa Balfour sagt, äh, man muss sagen, ähm, eher die die sagen das Politikfeld erweitern, also nicht nur über Flüchtlingspolitik sprechen, sondern man muss über, über die Randbedingungen sprechen, dann gehört die Frage, wie erzeugen wir in Europa wieder ein Mehr an ökonomischer Dynamik, an Innovation, an Beschäftigung, ja, weil sonst, glaube ich, wird es wirklich schwierig, diese Offenheit zu erhalten oder wieder zu erkämpfen. Gegenüber, gegenüber Flüchtlingen, sonst rutschen wir immer mehr in diese Nullsummen-Mentalität. Ja? Also was die anderen gewinnen, äh, das verlieren die, die, die Einheimischen. What are your thoughts about that? Right, well that's an easy one to start with. Thanks, Ralph. Um, I, I, I share that analysis. I mean, a little bit. You're parroting what I said, so that makes life easier. So, so here we are in a in a in a circle of agreement. Um, I think 20 years ago, uh, we took a sort of calculation that uh, by liberalizing trade and investment flows, automatically democracy and good governance and prosperity would spread. We would create middle classes abroad. They would demand. Uh, say in, in politics equal to their contribution to the economy, um, uh, authoritarian regimes would become democra uh, democratic uh, and better run. We, we believed it was an inevitable process. We believed too, I think, that we needed to share um, uh, uh, our bit of the cake with as many people as possible. Um, and expand the cake as much as possible in, in sort of global economic terms. That calculation has not paid off in some key ways. We've grown the middle classes. They're not liberal. The, the people who supported that in other countries thought that they were winning, they were fighting a sort of identity battle and that they could anchor their countries into a Western order. But the people that have become rich are people who want national solutions and local cultural solutions. So we've made people wealthier, but not more liberal. And I think that's backfired. We've expanded the cake that other countries enjoy, but they turn around, as you say, to us in a zero-sum way and say, well, you know, recognize our power. Your power has shrunk. So that idea of sharing hasn't paid off. So I think that calculation is gone. But nevertheless, I think sort of some of the basic things that we were aiming for in terms of sharing power um, these mechanics are there, and that's what I was trying to get at sort of in my last section of both empowering the individual and recognizing human agency because power is flowing sort of down away from the state and also recognizing the sort of the regional level and that sort of thing. So, I th you know, 
it may be a lack of ima imagination on my part, but I think that certain parts of our calculation may be paying off. And if we throw the baby out with the bathwater at the moment, we really haven't got anything. So what was our strategy then? Where are the green shoots? Um, and if we, on purpose, try to sort of devolve our power to other people, how, how do we actually exploit that now and harvest you know, other sources of support? Um, that, that's sort of where I am at the moment. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, this is a sort of, I'll simplify things, but, uh, you know, this sort of globalization went wrong, um, did not produce the kind of global development that was expected, and therefore um, um, has not, um, well, I mean, we know what's happening in Europe, zero growth or close to zero growth, but at the same time, the level of growth in other parts of the world is such that many actually want to move to improve their life conditions. Um, and... So, so what is it that went wrong? Uh, and at the same time, sorry, just to add on to that, we also have the backlash because we have the backlash of those states who um, either have been uh, cronies with respect to globalization and therefore have only tried to extract the conditions that served to support the, the uh, perpetuation of the elites at the expense of the, of the people and therefore creating um, population movements, either because states have collapsed or because they have tried to repress certain groups. So we have these sort of mixed flows. On the one hand, those people who did not benefit sufficiently from the sort of globalization mantra around the world or because of the asymmetry of growth in individual countries and individuals in, in select parts of the world, or because we were not serious enough in the in changing world order and in building democracy and liberal principles elsewhere and therefore this has caused crisis and therefore this has caused um, population movement, forced population movement. Um, how do we get out of it? And again, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think first of all, and that's where we do need to be self-reflective, we need to think about the policies in the detail. What have the policies done wrong? We need to think about foreign policy in particular differently. It, you know, uh, one third of the flows come from Iraq and from Afghanistan. So two countries in which we've had military interventions. The third are coming from a country in which there was no military intervention. Well, there's sele individual select uh, bombing at the moment, but which we did not, where the policy, the West's policy was shaped by the failures in the previous policies. And in neither cases did we get it right. Does this mean that we, can, that we ought to wash our hands of it? Does this mean that we ought to let them, um, uh, that, that we ought to let the human consequences of this um, rot in a refugee camp? I don't think so. I don't think that has to be our choice. I think there are plenty of middle ways in between. We need to work with in, uh, on engaging with individuals, engaging with people, and much less with governments and and especially authoritarian ones. We need to work on on networks of individuals using technology which connects these people in Europe, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, in Turkey, um, just to give an example. But also on other issues, we need to work with civil society organisations around the world. We need to work much more on prevention, and we also need to work on the idea that people move because they always have moved. So they're people who are forced to move and that's where we need to perhaps have proactive intervention elsewhere. And they're people who move because they want to move. And move, mobility has always brought growth. Mobility has brought innovation. Mobility has brought cultural exchanges. It has brought a host of positive things that we forget. Europe is based, it, it grew on mobility. It grew on you know Phoenicians reaching the coasts of Sicily. Um, it, it, that's the history of Europe. So we can't brush it away and can't uh, imagine communities that are not multicultural. We can't do that. And, and we need to build narratives that counter that. Daran anknüpfend, wenn Sie jetzt noch mal ein, ein, ein Plädoyer sagen, dafür halten, uh, Mobilität schlicht als eine Tatsache der, der globalen Welt zu akzeptieren. Ja. Ähm, gibt es Grenzen aus Ihrer Sicht für, für sagen die, die, die Aufnahme von, von Fremden, also Grenzen für, für, für Mobilität? Äh, 
mit denen Politik umgehen muss, auf die Politik reagieren muss und welche Möglichkeiten der Steuerung und Regulierung ähm, sind notwendig und legitim. Legitim. Ja, oder oder sagen, beziehen wir eine Haltung zu sagen, okay, äh, das ist sozusagen ein Naturereignis, das sich der politischen sagen, Steuerung entzieht und die einzige Frage ist, wie wir möglichst gut damit umgehen. Question to both. Um, I, I'm, I'm very mobile, so I think it's a good thing. But if I if I look at it in global terms, mobility worries me because it's because it's still you know we talk about this massive refugee population or massive migration population. We're talking about a tiny minority of people. We're talking about. I don't know, I mean, figures at the moment aren't properly available. We're talking about perhaps 3.2% of the global population living outside its country of origin. It's a tiny, it's a tiny percentage. More people than ever are on the move, but that's only because there are more people. The global population has risen massively in the last 15 years. But the percentage of people hasn't grown who are actually migrating. It's still a tiny minority. And I think it was something like 2.3% in 1965. So it's barely grown, despite the massive opportunities that we could have. Um, if you look at the figures in Europe, I think something like 5% of Sweden's population does 50% of their international travel. Um, and there are similar figures for France. So mobility may be normal, but it only seems to be normal for a very small percentage of the world's population, despite growing, gosh, you and your clapping. Um, uh, despite the growing opportunities for that. And I think that's an uh, mo But maybe we, we should differentiate between mobility and migration. Hmm? I, I think there's a growing split anyway. You're seeing at, at the sort of... Uh, if, if I look at global politics now, I wonder, I wonder if mobility doesn't become a sort of dividing line um, in politics between a small hypermobile minority that becomes sort of permanently temporary, um, that flits between states, that, that enjoys job opportunities, which is more secure, which, which sort of has sort of personal democracy in the sense that they're voting with their feet. Yeah, this, this small minority that benefits. I think you are seeing then classic migration patterns that are sort of re-emerging in the sense that we thought that we'd moved away from, from the once-in-a-lifetime migration that you got sort of in the 19th century or something. You know, people get on a steamer and that's a, you know, that's a, a decision for life. I think those patterns of sort of forced migration are re-emerging. But in terms of the sort of the, the, the divisiveness of mobility, I think it's between a tiny sort of hypermobile minority um, which are sort of skimming the benefits, and a large sedentary population, which are still trying to sort of realize classic territorial order. So it is normal, but it's incredibly divisive. Um, and I think we do have to work out, okay, what, what degree is normal? And yes, I think it, it probably is. Until we have a better solution uh, for living together than, than democracy, than state building, than all these things, then, then I think the limits need to be in place because otherwise this will become very divisive if we start talking about this sort of hypermobility as, as normality. Sorry, that was rather convoluted. Run with it. No, I think we need to be careful because there's forced, the people who are forced to move. I mean, the peop and many of the people who are coming to Europe now have nowhere else to go, okay? And that's, that's one thing. There's another thing is that people are moving because they're looking for better opportunities, because they want to send money back to their family, they want to send their children to school, and they're following the market. They are going where there is work. I mean, I think we should, you know, and that's, in Europe, there still is a demand. There's demand elsewhere. If you look, actually, I've looked at the population movements from North Africa, and there's an increase in economic migration from North Africa to the Gulf, because there is work there. So, so let's not forget that you know, this is not just about um, you know, us having limits. It's people come when there are jobs. People come when there, is, when, there, when there are labor market needs. And then we have people who come because they have nowhere else to go. And I think they're two separate discussions in a way. Now, I do appreciate that we have mixed flows because some 
uh, not simply fleeing. Some are, and also when it's you know with the family, they families are there to stay for longer periods. So the investment that is need that need that is required is an investment of the sort that one would make for economic migrants. So and um, well, except for the fact that frequently economic migrants are just one member of the family and they don't necessarily bring the whole family also because of restrictive policies on family reuni reunification so i do ag agree that they're mixed that they are mixed flows and it's difficult to single out you know it, um but i do think that somehow that distinction needs to be made and we need to remember as you were saying the human agency markets attract people and you know if obviously if we have 20 years of zero growth then europe will be far less attractive Bevor wir noch mal am Ende konkret werden, würde ich doch gerne auf dieser Metaebene einen Moment noch bleiben, nämlich die Frage, was, was haben Grenzen eigentlich noch für eine Bedeutung? Ähm, ich meine, wenn man die, die, die europäische sagen, Politik in den letzten Monaten rekapituliert, ähm, dann läuft eigentlich alles äh, auf das Mantra hinaus, wir müssen unsere Außengrenzen sichern, Außengrenzen sichern. Um, und das heißt den, den Zugang für Flüchtlinge um, weitgehend reduzieren. Um, also Grenzkontrolle ist äh, ja nur ein anderes Synonym für Abwehr. So. Äh, die, die, die abstrakte Gegenposition wäre offene Grenzen. Aber wo ist der Weg dazwischen? Also was haben Grenzen noch, ich würde sagen, für eine legitime und produktive Funktion? Ja, gibt es überhaupt ein politisches Gemeinwesen ohne Grenzen? Und gehört die Frage der Kontrolle von Migration nicht äh, zu den Kernfragen von politischer Souveränität? Ähm, und wie verhält sich das zu internationalem sagen, Flüchtlingsrecht, vor allem dem humanitären Flüchtlingsrecht, was ja keine Obergrenzen kennt? Das ist ja ein realer Widerspruch. Also was würden Sie sagen, ist legitim äh, an einer Politik der, der Kontrolle der Außengrenzen? Welche Instrumente? Yeah, Roderick very unfairly asked me to go first, and this is not my topic. I do think there is something in between. A more permissive asylum law. Hmm? Mm -hmm. um, there, is, there, is plenty, there are plenty of initiatives on circular migration. These movements of people are not you know, getting on the steamboat and moving to another continent forever. That's not what it's about. And there's a lot more going on, and I think that can be helped and supported. Um, but yes, the whole concept, the whole um, development of uh, European competence on migration issues has centered a lot also on the construction of borders and on the strengthening the security of the external border, um, which is not just about building walls. It's about, um, it's about data. It's about um controlling movements in and out it's about security and we know of course there's this whole other debate going on about um security so i think the only way and i, I think in a way the, the the sort of the europeanization of this dossier moving it out of control of the member state well partially or shifting some responsibilities to the european um, level has by necessity entailed a degree of securitization of the of the dossier so so i think that there's an inevitable conflict there which can only be compensated by more permissive legal channels legal that's the first thing actually and perhaps we should have mentioned this at the very beginning of this discussion because it seems to have fallen to the back of the agenda it should be at the top of the agenda but also more permissive um, rules on, on, I think, asylum and granting refugee protection. And thirdly, international diplomacy to get other countries to contribute. You said that at the very beginning. Again, something Europeans did not do at the beginning. Of, well, when this, what was happening, became evidently uh, a, a, a problem, not just a humanitarian problem out there, but actually a problem that was knocking on our doors. So I think these three elements have not been um, looked at sufficiently. And I'm going to repeat, though, I mean, the, the question that um, Roderick, I'm not sure we agree upon, you know, this sort of building democracy, and I'm not talking about going with, you know, soldiers and boots to go and oblige the Saudis to build a democracy. I'm not talking about this, but I do think there is more that can be done on foreign policy terms to make or to dialogue with other countries to make them much more friendly towards um, human beings, um, 
uh, especially if they're fleeing from conflict. Roderick, would you like to add? I don't know if I want to, I kind of have to. Um, uh, I'll do my best. Um, uh, courage. It's not courage. I've to, I was complaining about I've got a very small baby who keeps me awake at night and he's getting all his teeth. So your questions are playing havoc with my brain. Um, uh, let, let me make three points since I've had time to write something down. Firstly, I mean, we all know the symbolism of, of borders and we all, you know, we can all kind of deconstruct that. It's fascinating to sit in Brussels and see how that's kind of playing out in inter into institutional turf war and the way that Frontex is trying to position itself as, as the Europol at the border and the asylum agency at the border and is, is sort of, you know, trying to get as much done in these hot spots as possible under its control. Things that, that would normally be done either inside the European Union or in cooperation with countries outside. Um, so it's playing out that sort of that political dynamic is, is being kind of cemented in institutional terms um, in ways that are rather inefficient. So that's kind of the first point. The second point is that, you know, the big buzzword over the last five years has been, you know, all about sort of smart borders, which has been about sort of individualizing the way we treat people at the border, getting them into sort of programs that we say, we know who you are, so you can come in and out more easily. Um, that seems to have been put on ice and I think what you're seeing at the moment is individuals are taking control of their own paths across borders. Um, what I keep hearing in Brussels is this idea, people saying sort of, we used to say that, that time and space were shrinking with globalization. Um, you know, it, it was easy for us to cover greater dif dif distances with goods, ideas, and so on. Now time is still shrinking, but space is expanding. So the people who are coming in are taking control of um, uh, spatial positioning technology, new kinds of technology, new kinds of travel, taking their own paths across borders. And the more we alienate people, the greater the distances we have to guard. So I think that's gone missing, the idea of individualizing our borders, helping people come in. Third point, very quickly, is we've ceased to understand the world around us. It's making us incredibly reactive. I think the same the, the sort of the information and the migration crises are twinned. So the same wars that are displacing people in our neighborhood are making it very difficult for us to gain good information about what's happening. The same democratization of communications, which is enabling migrants to take their own paths across borders, is also empowering them to sort of control the flow of information and how we see things. And also I think the sort of the geopolitical rivalry um, which is displacing people is also spawning new narratives about about you know why people are moving who they are and so on so if we want to sort of understand the world around us better um, and be less reactive i think we need to get away from a very sort of technocratic idea of sort of evidence-based policy making and realize that actually we're playing in quite a tough geopolitical environment when it comes to these things and, and bump up our game a wee bit there um final question um, please brief and uh, quick answers um, das stichwort legale zugangskorridore ist jetzt mehrfach gefallen um, und es ist klar dass das also ein, ein kernbestandteil jeder liberalen und humanitären Flüchtlingspolitik sein muss, die sich nicht verabschiedet äh, vom, vom Völkerrecht. Ähm, welche Bedeutung haben in diesem Zusammenhang sagen, Abkommen mit unseren Nachbarstaaten, die jetzt sagen, als Puffer für ähm, Flüchtlinge sagen, fungieren? Und konkret, wie beurteilen Sie das Abkommen mit der Türkei? Und wie müsste das verändert werden, damit es in dieser Richtung wirken kann. <laughs> Ladies first. Yes. Well, um, my overall um, evaluation of the Turkey, the EU-Turkey deal is negative. It only achieved one thing, which was to um, get some breathing time in, in the European context. 
um, because it did keep the numbers down and it took the sort of red alert off the debate. Uh, I don't know for how long. Um, I think, conversely, um, Turkey is in feels it is in a position in which it can use the movement of refugees as a weapon vis-a-vis -vis Europeans, and that Europeans have allowed this to happen. And I think this is a very negative development which speaks volumes also to other countries who might be tempted to do the same. I don't see this EU-Turkey deal as being, in its essence, fundamentally different from the Italy-Libya deal uh, in the time of Gaddafi. Um, second point, um, we'll see what Europeans have to say on visa liberalization, but I do think that visa liberalization overall has been a positive instrument with gains for most, uh, there's, there's the odd uh, they've been the, they were in those countries in which visa liberalization has been applied. There's been the odd, shall we say, um, increase in numbers of people um, applying for asylum from countries or you know, coming from situations where they didn't really um, qualify. Uh, but this is manageable. Um, so I think visa liberalization has actually been a positive tool. Um, but it does have some strings attached and it does have um, some procedures that need to be respected because it's not just for Turkey. It also has been used for other countries and it will be used for other countries and it's a very important tool. So if, uh, if as Erdogan has said, uh, Turkey doesn't want to reform um, its terrorist law in line with the requirements for the visa liberalization, well, I do hope that Europeans will not be sort of hard-nosed geopol geopoliticians and push that through anyway, because I think the consequences will be, far, will be more far-reaching than the consequences that this would entail, A, for the Turkish opposition, um, B, um, uh, for um, Europe as a whole. Um, so, shall I leave it there? Okay. There are more things I can say, hmm. but I'll leave it there. Rodrik? Um, on... On the mobility question, because I'm going to agree short, uh, disagree shortly with, with Rosa slightly on the Turkey deal. On, on the sort of mobility question, at the moment we're still in a sort of top-down uh, uh, sort of quid pro quo move on, on, on this. We negotiate on how many people we take in. Um, uh, I prefer the clapping. Um, Go on, uh, please. Uh, and if you talk, you know, I'm just back from Istanbul. Um, they say, you know, the EU in this deal thinks it's doing something progressive in resettling people. It's resettling people who don't want to be resettled in Europe. Um, so, you know, we're still in a kind of, in this sort of negotiating state-led process. If I mention smart borders, then I suspect that's the future. If you start individualizing these things, then you take away a little bit the leverage um, to negotiate on these things. Um, and if you can sort of empower individuals to cross borders at their own will, then you get away from that a wee bit. So I suspect there's, there's the future in that, even though you're rolling your eyes. On the EU-Turkey deal, I, I want to squash Rosa a little bit when she says that it's self-defeating. Because I think it reinforces the impression that we're only um, uh, undertaking uh, migration measures because Turkey has a kind of hold over us. They'll turn the tap back on again. And I think that prevents us from putting European migration policy on a positive footing where we say, no, we're doing this because that's what we do, not because we're being made to and not because we've agreed to some daft deal. Turkey benefits from the closure of the, of the Aegean route. Um, so I don't, and they've also opened their labor market. So I think people are, are settling down and the Turks have an interest in, in keeping them there. We're not seeing a deflection of flows through the central Mediterranean either through Libya. So I think there is a window of opportunity here and I think we owe it to ourselves morally and practically to say, okay, well, what is the positive footing? So I would squash a little bit that we're being blackmailed by the Turks and say, okay, well, let's, let's work out what we want to be doing for ourselves on our own terms. Okay, vielen Dank. Wir sind jetzt schon deutlich über unsere Zeit. Ich hoffe, es war trotzdem für Sie ähm, interessant, kurzweilig, anregend. Unsere Aufgabe war ja ein bisschen das Feld äh, zu öffnen für äh, die folgenden ähm, Diskussionsrunden. Äh, ich bedanke mich ganz herzlich bei Ihnen beiden. Ähm, wünsche Ihnen... ja. Darauf habe ich gewartet äh, und entlasse Sie jetzt in eine...
kurze 15-minütige Pause, bevor wir hier mit dem nächsten Podium weitermachen. Herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much.